Thank you, guys. Okay. Thank you, guys, for coming tonight. It's Monday. Um, we have a great lecture. Uh, we're gonna have a, we're gonna have a lecture, and then we're gonna have a, a discussion. Um, uh, this is our lecture, but I'm not going to introduce him. I'm going to introduce the introducer. It's very, the it's very theatrical. Um, no, uh, we're very, very lucky to have Randy here tonight. I mean, I think his... Uh, how many people have seen Sleep No More? That's pretty good. Um, great. Um, uh, so uh, you probably know that we're doing a visiting critic studio this semester. And Bu Bing is teaching the studio, and he's collaborating uh, with Randy on, a variety, on, on some things here and in China. Um, and he's, in, he's, I think, uh, I'm not sure if Randy's going to be on the review or, or he was on the review or not, but, um, well, Bing can talk about that. Um, anyway, um, we're very happy uh, he's here, uh, Bing and Randy. Um, and I'm just going to uh, do no more than to introduce uh, Bu Bing, and uh, he's going to introduce Randy. Yeah? Okay. So thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, this is Bu Bing. He even has a prepared statement. He's pulling it out of his jacket. That's, yeah? uh, oh, that's the microphone. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's like a, it looks like, a, looked like you had won an, uh, an Oscar Crown, or an Emmy yeah. or something. You were coming out with your speech. Yeah. You can talk with this. Um, can you talk with this or you're, you're wired up? Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. good. Actually, so you guys know this is uh, Bu Bing. He teaches our Three Cities studio in the summer, and he's also teaching a visiting critic studio on a topic related to this, obviously, and I will leave it at that. Bu Bing. Okay. Hey. Thank you. All right. Uh, I'm so happy to get Randy here today to give a lecture and also have a discussion with us. Uh, someone from the theater world to discuss with us about urbanism, maybe. Um, so today, Randy's going to give us a 20 minutes introduction about his works, uh, uh, plays, these shows, this great experience he creates. Um, I, so maybe to me, Randy's more like the architect. He's the architect of a Mechatric uh, Hotel which is a theater place for Sleep No More. Um, actually, he's, he's actually that guy who transformed Sleep No More from a very avant-garde, very small kind of production into a off, serious off-Broadway production into these uh, 4,000, 40,000? 100,000 square feet. Yeah, production, yeah. So um, I, I was very inspired uh, after seeing Sleep No More. I, I saw it twice in, in, in New York City and in Shanghai. I, I actually found it might have a lot of things to do with urbanism and architecture as we see uh, things revolving in a, in a play, not in a linear sequence as in timeline, but more like specially organized, distributed, so that's why we have these visiting critics studio uh, called Double Scripted Urban Play. And I will introduce about our studio works after Randy's talk. And after that, we will do a group discussion. So I will leave it to Randy. So here's my little clicker. Um, so this is who I am, Randy Weiner, and I, it's interesting, I was talking to the Posit people, and they said to me, they were talking about designers versus architects, so I actually think I'm kind of offended that um, Bu Bing called me an architect, because I think I'm a designer. I hope I use that right, because architects, I think, make houses and things like that, and designers are doing some other higher level crazy thing, and I think that's what I'm doing is figuring out ways to make things that people don't even know they want yet, if that makes sense. Um, but to put a, some sort of frame around this discussion, I wanted to talk about venues, because I think my big thing is working contrary to what a normal venue is in performance. So I'm gonna look at some pictures with you. Oopsie, this one. Oopsie, not that one. I didn't practice. Oh, there we go. So the traditional performance venue, I, looked, I was in Boobing's design group for a second, and I saw they were looking at theaters. So I was like, oh, add some talk about theaters. 
So this is a Greek amphitheater. This is where Western performance began for a lot of people. Um, that, that floor there uh, actually emulates the sort of Greek traditional religious floor, and the whole thing's based on religious ceremony. So that's, that's the Greek amphitheater. It happened in the daytime. The whole city would show up. Then um, we're going to skip way ahead. We go into the dark ages. There's no theater happening. Um, then we do these things in the medieval times called pageant wagons. And this was, this was the really popular kind of theater at that time where a wagon would come in, the walls of the wagon would come down, and they'd do shows which were traditionally based on the Bible. So this is a pageant wagon. So um, then, of course, there's Shakespeare's Globe Theater. Uh, again, it happened during the daytime, and the sunlight would come in, and there were the groundlings, the people on the ground who would be eating you know, turkey wings and having sex with prostitutes. And the queen would be sitting up there, pristine, in the higher balconies. And they'd all be together. They called it the globe because they felt it emulated the whole world because all walks of society were there. Um, so then uh, a next, another stage of theater is kind of the age of opera, like when Mozart would do his, his operas. And when you go to theater then, it started to get in what we would recognize more as a Western kind of uh, theater venue except there was no sense that the stage had to be the central focus. All of these people who were sitting on the sides would actually be lit up the whole show, and part of it was to look at each other. You'd sit in an opera box, and you'd show up wearing your fanciest clothes. And that was equally important as a societal event, to just be seen and see others as what was going on on stage. So it was only with the advent of Mr. Richard Wagner that he had the idea that what's going on on stage, he's a great sort of German composer, he had the idea that what's going on on stage was the most important thing and we should sit quietly and watch only that. So he's the guy who came up with the idea, let's turn the lights off on the audience and keep the lights only on stage so your focus is completely and entirely there. So that's the tradition that I grew up on. You know, I grew up, I'm from New York City. I go to see all these Broadway shows with my dad. Um, I was saying when I was talking to these posit guys that, you know, it, 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 once you've seen enough shows and if you've seen them at a young age, you, you start to get all the conventions and the lights go down in the audience and then the lights come up on the stage and the curtains open and we're supposed to laugh and cry and cheer and the lights close again and the lights come back on us and we leave. So all that just seemed like a structure that became so familiar to me. I wanted to, um, I just wanted to feel more uh, alive in it. And it's funny, because when I was doing this, thinking about what I was going to talk about here, I talked to my office, and just for whatever reason, one of them Googled me in my past. So I went to Harvard. This is the Harvard Crimson. And shockingly, this is in October 1st of 1983. I am like just a college freshman. I decided to do a show in my dorm room, which struck me very transgressive. And just by being transgressive, that struck me cool. Like I, thought, I, I thought I'd wake up people's um, sort of attention, so we would all become tourists. Let's say, you know, when you're a tourist and you go to a different country, all the little details are, mean so much to you, the way the sidewalk looks. When you turn on the faucet, everything is a little bit different, so it's interesting. So it just seemed to me like suddenly this show, we were doing We Clow, which is the Sartre play about all of us being doomed to hell with each other. No audience whatsoever. In, in French, we did it. There's really no audience whatsoever, but if we did it in the room, somehow the whole experience would sort of take on an elevated status that would be greater than just seeing the play. So that's why, that's why this just immediately interested me. I think it's interesting also because um, I could do it. Like, no one had to say to me, yes, that's a good idea. It was my own living room. So then I got audacious after succeeding in my own living room, and I thought, I'm going to bring shows to other people's living rooms. So what I would do is, at Harvard, we had these dorms where you have a common sort of vestibule. I would, I wanted to do Artaud, who's a, never, no one does Artaud. His plays are completely incomprehensible. But I liked Artaud, so I was like, I'm going to do Artaud. We would knock on people's doors with a troupe of five actors, run into their common rooms, and do some crazy show. And part, these, his shows are very violent and crazy. We would destroy the people's rooms, and then run out and say thank you. So the whole thing struck me again, transgressive, exciting, different. And again, made it more of an event than just, you know, doing a show on a stage. 
So then, so all of this is just allowing me to do shows that really, a French show, an Arto show, without anyone saying, okay, so I was successful at it, so then Harvard gave me the permission to do a show at the um, Carpenter Center, which is by this guy, Le Corbusier, who I'm hoping that some, is that a famous guy? Yes, right? Shows, I don't know anything about architecture. So they, they, they were like, do this show here. I was like, fantastic. So this was the first time I sort of took it to another level. Because doing a show in someone's dorm room, I was just doing the show there because I could do it. Now I was like, oh my god, this is a really cool place. I can actually use the architecture to sort of create um, an interesting piece. So this was my moment of like, aha, uh -huh. we can actually make the piece specific to the architecture. So we designed this new show where they would do Sisyphus. This was this crazy long um, rolling entryway. So we do Sisyphus and we had all these guys rolling this enormous ball up this thing and then on the other side it would roll down. So I thought that was so clever. I'd use the architecture in this cool way and we had all these windows and I would put different people in all the windows. So it was really a, a show sort of custom made for, um, for this space. So then um, I graduated college and uh, I don't have access anymore to incredible places like Corbusier, the, the Corbusier's um, Carpenter Center. So a place that struck me interesting, though, were nightclubs. So nightclubs, um, if you're just starting out, you got out of college, you don't have any money, nightclubs all have incredible sound systems. Um, actually, I'll show that in a second. They have incredible sound systems. They have beautiful wood floors for dancing. They have incredible light systems. And from 8 to 11 o'clock every night, they're completely empty. So I just thought, wow, this is an incredible real estate play to start doing my shows using all these things. So this is like the 1980s, like 1989, at this crazy club, which is the Red Zone. And somehow I convinced them to let me do my show there. So we did this show. This is really just makes me happy to see this. Uh, you know, guys ever hear of a little show called Hamilton? Yes. So, You'll read that. This is from Genius. You know that rap genius thing? Remembering the hip-hop musical that hit New York City 25 years before Hamilton. So I did a hip-hop show at the club. This just makes me happy to see it. We put all these like hip-hop kids in it. And again, it was sort of using the club because it felt like a hybrid. We were doing something that felt like a hip-hop show, but also was telling a story. All right, so then um, after, after doing this stuff in, in New York, it was really rugged because New York is a sort of an unfriendly place to um, do a show because we really had a hard time getting audiences to show up. Um, and I had a friend who lived in Wisconsin. Anyone here from Wisconsin or Minnesota or any place like that? So, you know, I'm from New York. I never thought I would ever go to Wisconsin. And I land in Green Bay, and um, what I realized is they have no theater. So a lot of people think, oh, well, you're the only theater in town. But actually, the fact that they had no theater there meant that people really weren't interested in theater. So we tried to do theater originally in, in regular sort of performing arts places. No one would come. So then I was like, rather than have the people come to me, I'm going to go to the people. Because what they do have a lot of are these roadside like bars in Wisconsin. And I was like, I'm going to bring my show to the roadside bar where they have this like Harley Davidson comes from Wisconsin. They had a Harley Davidson like biker group there, which is unlikely that I, you see me, would be hanging out with a bunch of Harley bikers. But somehow, I befriended this guy, and they were like the, the rock group at this like total roadside dump. Um, and we did a show together. And it was like fantastic, because all their people, they were like beyond the mic, because they were like, all right, they'll come to our play later tonight. And you know, the people would all just stay, and they're all drinking. So that again opened up another sort of idea to me of bringing shows to where people were. So then, I, um, I, I got you know, so successful in Wisconsin. They, if you know Wisconsin, it's on Lake Michigan. So they have these beautiful beaches. So this is a beautiful beach, Bailey's Harbor. And I realized in the summer, it's full of people. So again, in my notion of bringing theater to where the people were, I was like, I'm going to bring this show to the beach when people are there. So we did this ode to joy. And again, I think I get a real delight out of doing something that's so uncommercial, like to do Beethoven's Ode to Joy on a beach in the summer. I think I take a perverse delight in that. So we dressed all these people up as Beethovens. They'd be running around the beach. Um, and somehow it worked. Somehow just the sheer beauty of the place, the unlikeliness of these performers, that is in fact me. Oh my god. So I'm running around the beach. That makes me happy also. <laughs> I'm running around the beach. And this is like you know, 20 years ago, whatever it was. Um, but then, 
what, I, what actually happened there, and I think, you know, some people have asked me about this today, do your shows have randomness? Actually, my shows all have randomness, but it's all controlled randomness. This was the first show where I really thought randomness is a good thing because as we were doing the show, as good or as bad as it was, at one point, randomly, a flock of geese flew over that beach. And it somehow timed out with the music, and it was this extraordinary thing that, honestly, whenever I go back to Wisconsin, because I still have a lot of friends there, they'll say, oh my god, that moment when the flock of birds flew over to the Beethoven. And of course, I had nothing to do with that, complete luck. So that's when I thought, oh, well, randomness is an important factor. So after doing Wisconsin for a while, I, I, I got tired of, I don't know, just being away from New York. And I thought, all right, now I've got the confidence. I'm going to go for it in New York. And um, again, in my spirit of trying to bring a show to where the people were, I, um, I, did, a, I did this show downtown. Um, where there were a lot of nightclubs. This is like the 1995 on the Lower East Side. If anyone's been to New York, it doesn't look anything like this anymore. It's amazing in 22 years. But we did a show. Um, first, at first, actually, I did a show on the street, on this street, because, again, I was just trying to get a reputation in the neighborhood. So we somehow convinced the street to close down. This was the street where we did the show. It was all graffiti, all crazy. And I got, again, all the local people to be in the show. So I got the guy who ran this, ran the grocery store, the person who ran the hat shop. And we all did the show. And then I convinced the fire department to let me use this fire hydrant to make a waterfall at the end. So it was all just convincing people, but it really ingratiated me with the community. And then I had this idea that we're going to do a show in this piano store um, where this, if you're from New York, pianos is a very famous venue in New York. Um, Right now, it looks like this. When I was there, it actually was a piano store. It's that weird thing when you're old, where you hear things like the meatpacking district in New York City. And I remember when it was actually meatpacking. And now, you know, it's, there's nothing to do with meatpacking. It's all fancy stores and fancy developments. Well, this was this piano store. And we actually turned it, we were part of this group that turned it into pianos. And we did a show there because pianos was kind of like a nightclub. We did a show that was a mix of a nightclub and a show. So this was another new idea to do a real hybrid. Like that actually was going to make the show be a little of both things. And that was the show we did called The Donkey Show. And people would go to the show, and sometimes they would just think they were in a nightclub, because the show was kind of going around. But if you wanted to just dance, you didn't have to watch the show. Um, but if you wanted to watch the show, the show was there. And it just, again, felt cool in the way that all my shows, because they were sort of recontextualized, seemed cool. So we did the donkey show at another club, the skeeziest show on the Lower East Side, Pyramid Club. Then we did the show in a bigger venue called El Flamingo. Um, then we did the show even in a bigger venue um, in Boston, Oberon. And after that, sorry, then after that, the show traveled all around the world. So it was just very interesting that this was the moment when I did the show, Donkey Show, that by hybridizing it, by really making it fit the environment, because the whole show was a version of Midsummer Night's Dream, set in a disco. So again, the fact that it was set in a disco, we set the audience as if they were club goers. So if people were dancing and not paying attention to the show, that's great, because that's what that character would be doing in the show. If people wanted to watch the show, that's great too. So again, this was this massive sort of global hit for us in our tiny world. But at this point, still no one really cares about um, you know, immersive theater. It's not a buzzword the way it is now. So after running that show, um, what I realized was we became the promoter. If you run a club, if anyone knows anything about clubs, they hire all these promoters to bring people there. Just the way kind of your dean was grabbing all you guys to like get you to show up here. That's what like clubs are doing. And unlike here, he doesn't get to make any money off your showing up. But if I own a club, one or two of you might drink something. It is an, like good odds that one or two of you are going to buy a drink. And in that way, I made money. And also the room looked a little more full. But that's the same as here. So that's not different from here. Anyway, so what happened was um, I realized when we were doing the show in the club, because I didn't own the club, the nightclub owner made a fortune. Because for every dollar I made at the door, and I was paying all these you know, actors and designers, he was making that at the bar. So I really thought, wow, this, is, this would be huge if I could own the bar, because then I could basically charge, not charge anyone, not charge people rather, rather anything to come into the venue. So I opened this place in New York called The Box. So it opened at this sign store, and it's funny, when I was in... Boobing's um, studio, everyone was doing all these 
cool things where it would be like you're in a sewer or, you know, you'd, you'd have these worlds that were kind of transgressive. So this is this place on the Lower East Side. This is when the Lower East Side is still pretty filthy. And rather than have the place even turn into pianos, which was a venue, we tried to play, keep the place super secret. Like it was really a speakeasy. It still looked like it was Spanger's Signs, and, which was a very famous sign store in New York. Um, and we had the active driveway. And there was really no way to tell that this was a nightclub. We did everything we could to keep it secret. So um, this was a place, again, I controlled both the bar and the show. And that just gave me a lot of possibilities to um, just structure it where I didn't need to charge people to see the show. People would just buy drinks at the bar. And the show's going on, again, all around you. Um, so this is more shots of the box. So then, after doing the box, um, I was interested in doing another sort of larger scale project because the box was pretty small. And I met this design group in London called Punch Drunk and they had done this show there, Sleep No More. And they did it sort of small. They did it in 10,000 square feet. But I wanted to do it in like 100,000 square feet because I'm like, this is New York. To make an impression in New York, you have to like, you know, make it massive. So we um, found this venue and we took up initially 80,000 square feet of it to do this show, Sleep No More. And um, this is when uh, the idea of immersive became massive. So suddenly, I, I thought I was doing something very strange. You saw like in the 1980s, I'm doing weird things in my dorm room. But suddenly, these weird things I was doing caught on with sort of the mass public cultural imagination. And you know, what was this? Was this a dance show because the people danced around and sort of told the story of Macbeth? Was it a haunted house because you'd wear masks and the whole thing felt kind of scary? Was it just nightlife because it was kind of sexy and strange the way nightlife is? So it, again, it was all the things that I felt I'd been working on, the hybridization and, you know, we own the bar. There was all the different economic models, all the different creative models. Um, so this became this massive uh, touch point where video designers were coming to us and saying, you know, we want to... Uh, we want to base video games on this because it feels like with your hundred different rooms and this sort of open exploration, this feels like the way a physical 3D interactive version of a video game. We get people like Boo Bing who's excited, you know, and brings me to an architecture school to talk about this sort of thing. So as, as Boo Bing was saying, this show was a big hit and then it transferred to China and right now we're working on doing it in a whole bunch of other cities in the world and it's just a massive massive project, which again speaks to a hunger, and again, maybe it's the times, maybe we helped kickstart the times. I don't know where I fit into this, or this project is, but whatever the case, right now, this has a lot of cultural interest. So after doing that, um, I had an audience. So I have a very big audience in New York, a massive mailing list of people who say, we want to do something interesting. So I got offered this other venue, and they were like, oh, will you do a Sleep No More? And I said, no, 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 I will never do another Sleep No More because I don't want to do anything that would be compared to Sleep No More. I'm going to do something completely different, and rather than just deal with everything I've dealt with, which is bar and nightlife and theater, I want to add something even harder. I want to do food, so, which is a really stupid thing to do because food is the hardest, from a business standpoint, thing to, to control. But it just seemed to me, again, like how do I keep developing my audience? So this was a show um, called Queen of the Night. And my goal was if Sleep No More was dark and sort of dirty, this was going to be bright and shiny, um, you know, with all sorts of flex neon everywhere. So again, I, I just, I, I, in this case, I'm working on developing audience. And how do you offer more things so that Sleep No More isn't people's only access to what an immersive theater event is? So after doing um, all these shows, I got frustrated because the problem with them is they required huge uh, investment, huge amounts of space. And I, I, I thought, is there a way to design a show where you don't need a massive amount of space, where you can actually take any space? Because the problem with spaces, for what I need, I like spaces that don't have any pillars, that don't have any walls. Um, but most places you go to have pillars have walls, and are much smaller than 100,000 square feet. So I got very interested in this idea of, can we create a space in, instead of 100,000 square feet, do it in 10,000 square feet, um, and make it feel like 100,000 square feet in terms of the amount of experience people have. So we came up with a system of having curtains, like using the pillars, again, making the pillars an essential part of the show, not trying to fight it, not just dropping in a show that 
really should be on a proscenium, but I'm doing it in some weird way. But making the whole idea of it about the constraints of the space. So we would take pillars like that and put airline cable between it and hang sheets between the, between the um, pillars. And then we'd open sheets and close sheets in different configurations and you'd walk through the experience and each time you'd walk through, you would leave and come back and you'd be in a completely different place. So the show happened, you're in Hoboken, in these, in these different houses of all the people from World War II who are about to uh, get drafted and go, go to World War II. And then you go and you're in basic training or you're at a blood drive and we split the audience up and they all felt like they were exploring all these different areas and they kept walking back and forth and not realizing that they were only traversing the same 8,000 square feet even though they had gone to 20 or 30 different rooms. So that was an interesting, again, progression of, up, oh, do it. So this is another picture and this is some of the curtains I was talking about. We had a huge atomic bomb, um, guys in underwear, it was a dream, it's perfect. So then, um, so that's, that's, that's the last project I've actually been doing in New York. The next project we're doing, again, uh, feeds into my interest in being transgressive. There's a venue in New York that has uh, six floors below ground. It's 100,000 square feet. Each floor goes underground. This is a project I'm actually doing with a graduate of the illustrious, did you go to architecture school? Yeah. It's up? yeah. So David Rockwell. So this is a project where um, we are taking over this space that's completely you know, messed up in a lot of different ways. It hasn't been occupied for 40 years, and parts of it haven't been occupied for 60 years. So it's a complete mess. But again, how do we make that mess be part of our story? So we came up with a whole concept of it's right in the financial district. It's an extraordinary space. And when we were first thinking about this, we were still in the sort of um, aftermath of Occupy Wall Street. So we thought it would be interesting to have it be this kind of black market, that this kind of counter-capitalist group had taken over. And they did it uh, with a whole sort of agenda, which I'm not going to get into. It's a very complicated backstory. But they had all these different groups took over different areas of the six floors because it used to be the, it was, the, it was a major banking um, center. So there's these vault systems and there was probably like seven or eight, even nine sort of vaults. And the vault systems were so complicated, it felt just like Game of Thrones to be perfectly honest, where every one of these things felt like its own kingdom. So we, we would make these kingdoms and we came up with these weird, um, weird stores and weird sort of, there were sort of stores mixed with um, gangs of people who'd taken over this area right beneath Wall Street to create their own um, sort of counterculture mall, if that makes sense. So, oops. So this was interesting. This project's interesting because it's enormous floor plates that are open. So we just tried to figure out ways to do sort of large-scale designs to fill it. So this is one of the groups is the Flora Verdura group. Um, this was another Opto Futura where they're selling clothes, like high fashion underground street label clothes, but we're using mirrors to you know, make the place more complicated and, and also seem high fashion. This was great. This was David had been to some exhibit at, in France where they um, built these, this labyrinth of, of holes where people were crawling through at some museum and they built it all out of saran wrap just wrap over and over again. So that just seemed interesting, again, that these guys had sort of taken over this found spot and um, had sort of transformed it into their own sort of cheap world. So we were looking for large-scale cheap solutions. One of the places that we found, uh, it literally hadn't been open in 30 years. It was underwater when I saw it. So I was like, oh my god, you go four floors below ground in Wall Street, and it was underwater. So again, I thought that was extraordinary and using that. So that's what this is about. Uh, we also were playing with the fact that the air conditioning for the building, it was a 60-story building above it, was on floor number three. So that floor was freezing cold. So we thought, okay, we'll play into that too. So it's again, coming up with these unusual worlds, um, mixing in things that were givens. So this is another area where the floor, this is on the bottom floor, the floor had started to deteriorate to the point that you could actually see the earth underneath. So again, we thought, okay, this will be interesting. We'll make a... We'll make an installation about that. Um, this was an empty air. We had no idea what to do with it, so we were just like smoke it up, put a lot of neon, and make it cold. And again, all these different sort of cool ideas. So 
this is this project. We call it Happy V. Uh, right now is an amazing time in what I do just because the world has really come to this. This was a project that is actually being paid for by a retail company because retail people are all feeling that their business is dead. I never would have thought I would be making a show paid for by a very large tech retail company, but they're trying to reinvent what a retail experience is because what's going to happen in this show is, as I was saying, they all have their black market. During the day, you go down to the black market, you can shop there. There's little hints about the different kingdoms having tension between them. And at night, at 8 o'clock, we kick all those people out who were just there for the black market and people are invited to see a fashion show being presented by our black market people. The fashion show turns into a huge battle between all the groups. The place goes haywire from 8 to 11. And then at 11 o'clock, a sort of warlord takes over and the whole place resets because he puts order back in so that the place can open again the next day, if that makes sense. So it's this interesting kind of mix of something that's real. Like you'd be there, you could stop at the black market, you'd see these characters, and then they'd have hints of what they're going to fight about at night. You know, this guy's girlfriend and that guy's boyfriend and all these different complicated relationships. But it operates fully as a store during the day and at night it turns into a, a show. So again, it's, the world has come in a way too immersive entertainment. Every store wants to be immersive. Every store thinks it's theatrical. Every restaurant thinks it's theatrical. So it's just a very exciting time um, for me and hopefully for anyone who's interested in doing this kind of hybrid experience. That's all I have to say for here. Thanks. You're going to talk? Yeah. Great. So I try to connect back to our architecture work from the theater work from here. Um, Okay, uh, if, if we talk about theater and urbanism, probably, yeah, this is a, could be the immediate response, uh, Society of Spectacle, and that's 70 years ago, and maybe this is a like, real world situation now, Society of Spectacle, things more happening with your hand gadgets on a smartphone screen, and it's a reality that we have like every day, you're looking at a smartphone. I, I read a uh, report saying like people nowadays uh, have to look at smartphones at least 80 times a day, at least. And people maybe look at screens more, more times than at the real world. So spectacle, I think the definition of spectacle is like seriously changed now. And we only have a few very rare occasions to connect the real world Again, like the Pokemon Go did last year. I don't know, it's, it's less popular now, maybe. But I heard that early this year uh, in Chicago, they attracted uh, like 2 million people, uh, no, uh, 200,000 people to this big gathering and which melted all the servers and no cell phones can get connected. Um, so what, the, what are we doing like from, these are pictures from China. All these rendering companies are producing for the, like every new towns, new cities in the past 10 years. Um, it's kind of simulacra. We do not know where these images are from, but we suppose these are like ideal images for the environment we supposed to live in. And they're repeating itself again and again. So are these, so my question is, like, are these spectacles or the images like, uh, supposed to get people excited about the visions of the future, or is there simply something to fulfill the tasks being assigned to architects from the developers for, or from the governments, from any like, authorities asking you to submit something to like, fulfill a job? Um, so. Um, I think it's, and it's always a problem for, for architects and uh, maybe urban planners 
uh, always look at the cities from a omniscient way. You're supposed to know everything. You design from top-down structure to lay out the, the future, and supposedly everything is perfectly uh, done within the, free, within the framework. So um, if we look at the, the immersive theaters or the, the play, uh, the theater experience, the structure are very different in a, in, in, a, in, a, in a play structure. It's a timeline. You have a linear sequence. You have things happening from the beginning to the end. And in a city, you have things hidden in a, in, in a structure there, uh, popping out here and there. So um, but immersive theater somehow break down the, the barrier between the two practices. It start, you start to have things spread it around and let the audience to explore, to find out. And, mm, but look at the architecture, uh, architecture side or the, the programs of the, like, a, 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 a special practice, a special practice. Uh, this is a picture I took from our summer program, Three Cities Asia. Like, uh, in, I sent to the students about the, 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 the routes they're supposed to take in a day in, in Tokyo's Takeyama area. they supposed to arrive in the Asakura uh, house for the first thing and the next stop, the next stop. So the uh, Takeyama area in that case is experienced like a linear uh, thing. It's, uh, it's no longer a space for uh, students to explore. So, and actually, this is very usual nowadays for, our, for us, like tourists, you, uh, you go to visit a place, you have a plan, you, you, you plan things ahead, you, you, you see these things in 8 o'clock in the morning, then 9 o'clock, and a lot of places you've, you're going to visit are experienced in, a, in this kind of structure, not actually like you living there being experienced uh, in a more special organization. You can visit this point, that point, in different sequence, uh, in, in, in different ways. So also, this kind of linear uh, structure exists in um, like museum design. This is from a project we did uh, two years ago for a, 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 for a museum. We have the program exactly flowing through the building, and you're supposed to see the building from one point to, the, to another. So um, a more recent project by us is a market project in the, in, in, in the city uh, with very complicated programs with uh, market, with retail, uh, with hotel, and also with performance going on in this space. So it, it gets more complicated as you bring more people into that place. You have local residents. You can, you have visitors, you have tourists, you have uh, more uh, occasional visitors to this place, and people looking for different things at this kind of one, one place. So in this case, we start to think about this kind of project less, than, less about a like program scripts, uh, like two scripts or three scripts, but more like a um, a mechanism driven by the pressures uh, between different zones of a place. If you can divide it into different areas, or like the place being uh, secluded from the surroundings, you have certain threshold to enter in, and there the primary attractions can guide the flow into that area. Also, uh, we on purpose to construct the place with different layers, with the upper layer uh, with, uh, and lower level layer, uh, lower level with very different programs to um, get a high pressure between the two parts so the flow can happen by itself with these visitors coming into that place. And of course, we have a performance space uh, predicted for that area. So, um, in this case, we see that the, uh, the linear structure in a, in a theater play from the beginning to the end and supposed to have the excitement uh, happening uh, uh, in, on a time base could be transformed 
into a structure of space. You have space of excitement, a space or area of like less exciting, more everyday life, and the flow uh, in between them kind of can um, uh, can construct a immersive, if we borrow that term, a theater experience between different areas of that. So, and if we also think about this as a city, if we can do a city scale immersive play, there can be a lot of things revolving by itself, like plays, like different, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a theater play, there are like different acts, but in a distributed way, these acts can happen simultaneously in different areas, and you can start to explore them. These are speculations about the possibility of bringing these kind of immersive theater experience into the architectural practice. And uh, I kind of conclude these into a few terms that we can design with fragmented facts. You do not suppose to re reveal everything to the user of that space. And it could be incomplete narrative, like in Sleep No More, not everybody links that to Macbeth. You don't even know the whole story, but you can experience that. Even if it's incomplete, it still tells the narrative. Um, and also, it could be unfinished work, and that's uh, very much, um, I, I was inspired by uh, the show at Met Breuer last year called Unfinished, uh, Thoughts Left Behind, uh, Visible. And I see that show, the more, uh, more interesting part in that show is actually about the contemporary art scene, how these things are left on purpose to be incomplete, to be unfinished. And if it's a piece of work, it's supposed to take inputs and interactions from its audience. I think it's also a, uh, a term in, in contemporary theater, uh, what, how the, all these uh, nowadays work uh, are happening. And the last word uh, I learned from Randy, he's keep talking about the experience. Is that experience you can bring to the audience and in, in, in this space. And then if it's not a theater experience, if, if it's a urban or architectural experience, what it can be, if it's not a total one, if it's not a fully revealed one, um, that's, that's, that's the idea behind the studio project. And we have now uh, this visiting uh, studio uh, with school called a, a double scripted urban play. And the project is supposed to build a plausible quotidian story along with a play meaning to entertain. And the students are asked to do these following tasks. The first they build uh, the world. And this is pretty much the midterm, which is tomorrow they will present. And the world is supposedly plausible, and it has accessible public space or commercial venues. Uh, and it can be a city, either real or totally fictional. And it turned out almost like every team in my studio uh, picked fictional cities instead of real ones. And it must, even if it's fictional, it must have issues and challenges like what we have in our real world. And as a play, uh, it should be a, not be a linear structure it's spread. It depicts uh, interactions and inputs. It might connect online and offline contents. And it might adopt virtual reality, augmented reality, or other technologies. And the architecture here in this studio are defined as the tectonics of the world, which is the urban side, and diagrams of the special structure of the play and the visuals of the everyday life and the drama, and also definition and representation of a theater space in this. Uh, so here's the studio. And so far, we have done a few very interesting works. Uh, the first project, uh, the first week, first day, we started the, this project uh, of, of, of a study on performing arts typologies. Uh, students, each one picked uh, a particular performing arts uh, category and do, uh, uh, do a special diagram about the layout. Some of them picked uh, like uh, very traditional operas or um, theater, uh, Broadway theater or amphitheater like that one in the middle, the really huge one, and also outdoor performance. And there are also like, these tiny ones like puppetry or 
um, flash mob, which is also very interesting. And also, uh, if you look at the upper, uh, upper left corner, that's sleep no more space there. Uh, then uh, their students, our students are divided into five teams. Uh, each one will be, uh, build, each team will build a, a world. Uh, this one is called the, the archipelago, which is, is a city extremely separated. It's addressing the issue of separated urban blocks. And it also has this issue about, it, it has this like, city policy uh, dividing visitors to local residents. And we, uh, students are encouraged to examine the possible outcome of this kind of policy uh, from a top-down structure and how possible tactical response to this could affect the space. And we have uh, another team uh, doing this uh, fictional city with all these clear uh, urban patterns uh, examining uh, a, a city growing uh, limitless vertically uh, with this higher line structure as a public main public space, but at the same time, it has this information jamming tower which can get rid of all signage or, or censored information from the space. Highly fictional. And also we have this one. We, we, we don't have a name for this one. Okay. No, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, which has a very traditional urban pattern in the center, uh, represents the old city and has a very uh, vague ring outside of it as a virtual reality city. And the two words, the, the actual and the virtual reality, they intersect together and with technology of uh, virtual reality and like surveillance drones flying over in the old city area. Yeah. And we also have a uh, post-industrial city studying the possibility of co-living of industrial process with everyday life. And the highlight of this city is that the only transportation mean uh, here, I mean, uh, people's transportation mean is bicycling with a shared economy of uh, bicycling inside. And we have also an interesting project about uh, happening in Chinese city of Xi'an uh, where all the historical layers being uh, unearthed to the surface and utilized or exploited as uh, commercial venues, a overdeveloped commercial uh, tourism city. So these are the projects we have so far. And tomorrow will be their midterm, and you're all welcome to come over and take a look. That's it.
image of um, sleep no more? Yeah. So do you want to join us? Sure. Hey, don't go anywhere. This is the best part. This is the good part. This is the immersive part. It's just this beginning. People are afraid of immersive experiences. It's very intense. Thank you both so very much. So how much time do we have? 15 minutes? 6.24. So you said we lose who? How much time do we, should we have with this? Okay, 20 minutes. So we're going to have a conversation a little bit uh, here amongst us and then we'll, um, for just a few minutes, and then we'll open it up for some Q&A for the audience. Um, so thank you both so very much. Um, I guess I'd like to, Randy, I was real, what did you study at Harvard? I studied biochemistry. You did. <laughs> right, obviously. <laughs> But then um, I took a year off. I, I became disenchanted with biochemistry because my girlfriend at the time was doing theater and I would be in the lab all night. And, I, and one morning after being in the lab, literally watching mold grow, like literally <laughs> I was scoring colors of mold. And I, she saw me, she's like, oh, how was your night? And I was like, terrible. And she was like, my night was great. I rehearsed and I was like, I'm getting out of this business. So then I, I graduated as a psychology major, but I know nothing about psychology. I could just use all my credits. So don't ask me any psychology credit questions. So, OK, that says a lot. No, um, I guess I, I was really struck by something you started with, Randy. You said you, you're interested as a designer in making uh, things and experiences that people don't even know what they want. So I guess I'd like to just for a few minutes talk about uh, possibilities across kind of scale and duration, starting very precisely at, in the theater, and then uh, moving a little bit more speculatively to urban space. So I wonder if you could just, I mean, you mentioned Sleep No More, mm -hmm. and I wonder if you could just very, very briefly tell our students what actually happens in a performance of Sleep No More. Well, um, so you buy a ticket, <laughs> which is actually significant when you talk about duration, because I, I, I think not all shows, you know, start with buying a ticket, but that's all a separate thing. But for that show, you buy a ticket, and then we start to communicate with you and we tell you um, to be prepared to walk and not bring anything you know, that you're uncomfortable with. You have to check all your bags. And we are serious. We mean every single bag has to be checked. And then you're already a little titillated. You're like, what, what is this going to be? I have no idea. You know, no show does this to me. And then you show up and you, it's a nondescript sort of outside that used to be a bunch of clubs. and. Um, you wait in line, and it's all done with great mystery because you try and Google it online, and we keep secrets. You know, we don't want anyone to ever tell you what it's going to be. And then you go in, and you basically um, don a mask, and you walk around 100 different rooms. And everyone has a completely different experience. It's what I was saying, what is it? For some people, it's just an art gallery where you walk around to a room, and the rooms are done in incredible detail to the point that You'll go into a bedroom, and there'll be no actors there. You're just there by yourself. You can open up the desk of the, in the bedroom, and you'll see all these writings or letters or just character grace notes, a picture of a kid. And that will tell you about the story, because all those things are chosen and designed very precisely to tell you about the character and how the character fits into the story. So you can piece this together, this show together, without ever seeing a performer. Um, or you can follow one performer. You could say, I want to follow Macbeth. And you're running around the whole place trying to find Macbeth. But the truth is, if you only follow Macbeth, you're going to miss a lot of what Lady Macbeth's doing or Macduff's doing. So it's, it has a lot of the qualities that Bu Bing was talking about, where it's incomplete and it's, the narrative is not linear. Um, and then at the end of three hours, you leave. And you got a part of it. Who knows what part of it you got? And you talk to your friends and they try and put it together with you, or you say, I have to go back because now I understand it. Everyone has a very um, personal way to respond to that show, which is something that I love in art. Like I love in any art that you can truly have a personal response. That's what I was saying when I would go to the regular theater. Everyone has to get up and give a standing ovation together, and I always hate that because are we all supposed to feel exactly the same? And that's the goal of that kind of theater, and the theater I'm interested in is the opposite of that. So given that, so thank you. I think it helps set up the conversation. 
as the designer of that environment as a, an experience, can you talk a little bit about how much is fixed and how much is flexible? If we're talking about scripting possibility, and if we might think analogically about urban space or even architectural space, as the designer of that experience, how much do you control? Well, again, my goal with every experience, so I, I always feel bad, because Sleep No More is this monster. So everyone gets obsessed with talking about Sleep No More as if it's prescriptive in any way. So it's, that's my big caveat. For that particular show, um, and it's, I, to even talk about our percentages is absurd because you might go to the show and only see things that are relatively open, only see things that are interactive directly one-on-one -on -one with you and a performer. So obviously when it's you and a performer, no matter how much we script it, there's no telling what's gonna happen. I'll tell you this, I went to another show, this group Punch Drunk, it was the main design group for this. They did another show, and I had done donkey shows, so I'm like, I am Mr. Cool, immersive, you know, I know what I'm doing. So everyone, when you're watching an actor act, people tend to be a little nervous because you don't know what they're gonna do, they have this position of power, but I was so bold, I like sat down on the bed, like next to the person doing it. So the person, um, in that show, they do a one-on-one -on -one where they kick everyone else out of the room, and then as I'm leaving, the person grabs me by the hand, shuts the door to the room, and it's just me and this actor. So the uh, performer, um, what they want to do is remove my mask, because that show also had a mask. That's kind of a common thing in a lot of immersive shows, which I don't like that it's common, but whatever. They, they tried to remove my mask, and I was like, no, no, you must never remove my mask. I don't know what I got into. I got into some weird thing where I'm literally fighting the person. And this person is literally like wrestling with me, because that's the person's job, is to get my mask off, just to show you how far afield this can go. So the person became frustrated with me, and they grabbed a glass of water, and they threw, because it was happening in a nurse's office, where there was like a, you know, they grabbed a glass of water, and they threw it at me. And I don't know what came over me. There was a huge pitcher of water there, and I picked up the pitcher of water, and I threw it at the actor. So this is like many years before I started working with this group, Punch Drunk. And then I brought this up to them. I said, you know, here's a funny thing that happened. They were like, oh my god. You, because that was a very famous thing, you were that guy. Of course it was you. So that's how far afield it can go, because that scene, which was supposed to be literally, because she told me afterwards, she was supposed to lift up my mask, tell me a sweet story, and give me a kiss, turned into a full-scale wrestling match with me throwing a thing of water on her. So like, you know, there you go. That's, that's how crazy. But a lot of it is completely... Um, scripted and rehearsed to within an inch of its life, but the fact that you're doing it around audience and the audience doesn't always know where to go, you are alive. It's like these shows, that show I did, Donkey Show, we would have people be in that show for six years. So if you're in the theater, six years is an absurd amount of time for a New York City actor to be in a show, but they would do it because every night was different, because they always were alive. Because that's the problem with the actors, they start to, and that's, I smell that when I go to a Broadway show. Even the best Broadway show, they're just repeating, repeating. And without having sort of you know, roadblocks to make them have to wake up and, you know, really be alive in the moment. That's, that's a loss. And that sort of works against what live theater, we all say, oh, it's live, it's live, it's live. Well, that's really alive when they're having to make decisions in, the, in you know, real time versus, okay, you know. And, I, and what happens a lot in Broadway is if, if an actor tries to wake it up for themselves, you know, they'll do something and the other actor's like, why did you do that? That was dangerous, you know. So I'm working against a lot of those traditions. Is there anyone here from the theater world, like performing arts? No. Thank you. Usually I kill. Like I talk about this. I feel like none of this reads to you guys. Like how crazy the stuff I do. You're like, oh yeah, of course. So usually I'm going to do these talks. I was like, oh, that's crazy. Ha! But like here, it's like, you know, this seems normal maybe to you guys. I don't know. I don't know. You know, it's interesting and being this kind of links to what you're trying to do in the studio. So I think like over the last 10 or 15 years, certainly urban designers have been very interested in thinking about how to make, to design space for possibilities as opposed to uh, you know, fixed uses. Mm -hmm. And I mean, have you ever heard of landscape urbanism? No. Have you ever heard of? As I could <laughs> guess what it is. <laughs> have you heard of, the, have you heard of, a, of a, um, a, a, a Dutch landscape architectural practice called West 8? No. Okay, so there's a really great project in Rotterdam called Schoberg Plein, Theater Square, and it happened to be because it is around theaters but it was designed to be incredibly interactive 
and to really set the possibilities for people to use the space in different ways. And whether that is simply to think about putting electrical outlets across space so people could start to, you know, to do something impromptu or to give somebody a haircut or whatever, to thinking about different material palettes so when the sun moves across the space, there's warm space and cool space and different things happen in, across temperature, let's say. So there certainly has been thinking about how to uh, open possibilities in urban design. So with your studio, uh, if I'm not understanding correctly, you're actually thinking about moving performance out into space. So it's not about every urbanist being a, uh, a, a, an actor or actress. Mm -hmm. You're actually thinking about um, th theater in urban space? Is that what you're yeah. doing? Yeah. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about that then? Yeah, I see. Uh, Relative to this notion of the role of the designer. So, you know, so we've learned that the script is quite tight, but interactions happen, that, that possibilities happen. Yeah. So how do you do that? I think I, um, that could have two layers. Um, the performance ha going to be there in this urban space, even fictional space, could be like, First, thing, first layer could be the possibilities, like what could happen there. And the other layer would be more like an authorized a play, something formal, something uh, going to be there to encourage other activities. I think there, there, there are two, two ways of looking at this. And actually, I, I shifted the studio structure a little bit after it started. Um, so, uh, originally, I planned to have the play structure happen before midterm. Then I realized even word play could be a huge task for them. Um, they spend a lot of time on this word play. And I think it's more interesting to now to look at how certain rules, like these top-down structures, how it define the urban space, the public space, and how individuals could respond to that. So uh, what about some questions from the audience? Seiku. Hi, Randy. Hi. Um, I, I'm interested in that space, the, the box. Do you, yeah. First, do, do you still own it? Do you yeah. Still own, and um, how do you uh, curate that space? How does it change? Like, what kind of... Uh, so what we do there things? is um, we call it a theater of varieties. So we do variety acts. Um, and a variety act can be a juggler, can be a magician, can be a contortionist, can be an aerial act. It's the, sort of the oldest form of popular theater in America. Um, what we do is we um, put a spin on it where it turns into another form of theater called Grand Guignol, which I don't know if you guys, performance people know. Grand Guignol was, at the turn of the century, was a theater of horrors where you know, they'll behead people. And, the fiction was so real, they, people would really faint and scream. So it, it becomes a place of horrors also. Um, and that's important to us, what we're doing, again, because we're not you know, delivering something um, easy. I, I never like to deliver something easy. I like to really push people and get a visceral response. So some of the acts we do at the box are truly outrageous, um, especially because we do acts at 1.30 in the morning, which are already pretty outrageous. 2.30 in the morning, which raised the bar, and then if you are so bold to stay till 3.30 in the morning, hopefully we'll you know, provide you an experience you'll never forget. So, so I guess what I'm, I really want to get to the bottom of is whether um, it operates quite similarly to any other kind of theater space where the, the, the acts just change, or the, the plays just change, yep. or the stories just change, or are the, the programmat do the programmatic requirements of the space have to change, or do the the relationships between the people have to change, or does the physical environment have to really get we, redesigned each yeah, time? Yeah, it's a great question. We purposely designed it as an old-fashioned kind of vaudeville house. So the nature of vaudeville is 
that you can always change it because it's all these constituent parts and one day I'll get this juggler and the next day I'll get that juggler magician. You know, like, it's constantly changing and that's one of the things I think is excellent about it because it can e keep updating on its own. Does that make sense? I was obsessed when I was, before I did the box, with the Hard Rock Cafe. I thought that was the most genius thing because they had this idea, it was about rock. So they could show old rockers like Elvis Presley but they could always keep up to date because the new rocker, whoever it was, Britney Spears or you know, whoever, Whoever becomes hot, it fit into that. So that's the same way with our, our shows. We have some acts where the acts have made their, and if you watch America's Got Talent, it's a lot of the people who perform with us, except they'll do a much crazier performance with us. And sometimes it'll be their performance, and many times it'll be art, we'll direct it. We'll take them and be like, all right, you know, Hillary Clinton, you know, we, we did all this stuff when debating Trump and we would turn their, their debates into aerial acts and we'd dress two guys up and they'd be fighting in the air. So in a way, it was the same tricks, which is what, you know, variety is all about, but it just kept it current. So it always felt like, wow, this is 10 years old, but this is so up to the moment. Does that make sense? I don't know if that, but the, yes, the structure of the physical architectural structure is built purposely to resemble the classic variety house. I have a follow-up to that question of that Sekou's. Uh, when you talked about like corporations coming to you and that yeah. how every environment now is sort of tasked to be immersive. There's this kind of expectation. It's sort of a commodity now. So how do you how do you maintain transgression if it starts to be something that's needed everywhere? You know, it's funny because I did this interview recently and I said I'm never doing immersive theater, I'm going back to the proscenium. So I think I, I have, by my very nature, I, 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 I just can't help it, I'm an annoying. I was saying before to someone else that for the box is a perfect example. People will come to me and be like, the box, what an amazing club, and I'll be like, the box isn't a club. It's a theater. But if someone would say, oh my god, that's a theater of the future, I'll be like, oh no, no, it's not a theater, it's a club. So I think I have an, an innate sort of, um, spin thing going on. I've only come to terms with it recently that I can accept that I do that. So yes, I, I, I think that's always the goal is to constantly feel transgressive, but you know, it's funny for me because I'm 52 years old, I grew up in New York City, you would go downtown and see crazy shows. Shows where they built like a whole, you know, there was a, there was a famous show called Emperor Jones, and it's about a guy who's in a forest, it's a Eugene O'Neill play, and he's in a forest, and he's running around, and I went to see it when I was like 10 years old, me and my dad, the only two people there, and they're running around this forest. That was so immersive, but it wasn't hot then. And what I find frustrating now is how hot immersive is, and what I've already said, what I find even more frustrating is how everyone's sort of watchword is sleep no more. You know, like, what are you doing sleep no more? What's sleep no more? When there's so many other kinds of immersive things you know, to explore, so. Other questions? Uh, first of all, thank you for the amazing lecture. And uh, this question is about uh, the level of authenticity. So in order to bring uh, the way of designing theater into urban design, you're basically, um, so for theater, no matter what you do, no matter what you, like it's immersive, or it's just like uh, people on a stage and you sit behind, it's always about telling a story. But when you're designing cities, where, what, like, you can design the spaces uh, in, like, the ways that the immersive theater does, but what's the story of, that you want to tell? Like, how do you decide that this city, this city that I'm designing, has to tell this story? And without, like, de designing the story first, you can't really, like, think of what the, what's the possibility of interactions later, right? So, I guess my question is that. Oh, you want me? I, mean, I, I think that's a great question also because um, it's a process that I feel like you're sadly having to suffer through. He's, you know, he's helping us build this place in New York. So it's this, uh, it's this extraordinary place on 57th Street in New York where now they're building these massive, you know, 100 stories skyscrapers and it's all these very big buildings that feel very prestigious and very um, fancy. But in this one building, they had built in the 20s a church, and they built the building around the church. So you go into this 
place. And it, it, it doesn't make any sense in this neighborhood that you go into a building that just feels like a regular residential building, and there's an enormous church in the building, but it doesn't show any sign of it on the outside. So we were like, this is so cool. We're going to make up a story that this guy, this crazy guy, bought a church, and he's like killed someone. We made up all this backstory. So then we started designing it, and then the design started to separate from the backstory. And then the design sort of took preeminence, and we just were designing because, oh, that'll be cool. That'll be cool. And we lost sight of the backstory. Does that make sense? So it's just, it's a constant to me in what I do, going back and forth all the time. Like, wow, this would be a really cool effect. All right, how does that relate to the story? And it's very practical. I mean, I think it's interesting. The stuff I saw here is like so theoretical. It's so amazing. And I wish I could be theoretical, but I'm so in a pragmatic um, world, um, you know, it's like, wow, I know people will really like having a waterfall. Well, the waterfall has nothing to do with the story, but then I try and figure out a way. You know, it's like constantly going back and forth. So, I don't know if that's a... What about you? Maybe I should respond to this question. Uh, I think you cannot deny that both, uh, like a play, a, a, a script of a play or the uh, urban planning framework these two things are very much about authorities. Like, these are kind of top-down decisions you made, either to a fiction or to a real world. So it's, it's more about how flexibility, like how you can leave flexibility to these things, uh, comparing to total control, or in architectural terms, we always say this is a like very well carried out project to every details. Instead of that, can we expect more like changes, other possibilities, or like, participations from others? Keep that work from the beginning incomplete. And at the same time, uh, the narrative, it, it is there. It's, it's, these, these things are about like very big power. If you are an urban designer, you, you're working on a project of a, a, a two square kilometer big, it's about a lot of money, a lot of things, uh, power in that. But to do that, you have to be very carefully like, to allow possibilities to happen within the framework instead of seeing like, every corner, get every detailed pieces fixed. I, th I think that's that's very much about the urban design practice. It's also like what I have been um, done in the past uh, 15, 20 years. Can I ask a follow up? Uh, sure. Uh, so, but isn't cities already a theater? Yes. Yeah, like I, think, I feel like the, the reason I think uh, Sui Humor is so popular and so successful right now is because the things that it is scripted, is so scripted that and it's so detailed and it's so well designed, it's so well put there that allows as much possibilities as possible. So thinking of that, about that in like architecture or in urban design, isn't, like, isn't that just like programming for us? We already have a series of analysis on programming. I mean, you have a convenience store there, you have supermarket there and that's what you control, and I feel like the more fixed or more, the more top-down the programming is, the more possibilities that there is, right? Yeah, I, I, really, I really like that point. I, don't, I think we could have a long discussion about that. <laughs> <laughs> You're saying, but I don't get it. You're saying that the more top-down, what did you like so much about that? Uh, he's saying it's like actually more planned, more I think, it, like for for example, for in, in urban design, you have to program things to a to the next dimension. You have to get like more possibilities in a dynamic way, plan to foreseeing possibilities. I think exactly same thing with sleep no more. You have to expect all the possibilities, like how things might res like audience might respond to certain things. But I think the uh, and Mitesh will respond. But I think that that <laughs> that the. the uh, the translation to the uh, strategies and interests of a theater and a space and the play is radically different in the, at an urban scale, right? Mm -hmm. And 
I would say that your point about the city already being a theater reminds me of your example of the Globe Theater, which I love because of the idea that it is across demographics, it's across, right, it's across social convention, it's across all of those things that, quite frankly, designers have no control of, shouldn't have control of, or never have control of, right? So cities already act in this way. So the question does become, outside of, let's say, commercial programming and uh, that sort of thing, what can we do in spaces that sets up, that gives agency to uses by all, all both human and non-human species even, right? So I think it's a much more complex thing about what designers do. Mitesh. Well, I guess, I mean, in some, I, I sort of agree with her. Sorry, your name, sorry. Rem? Yeah. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> about what point? <laughs> no, Which oh point? Man. No, because I think in a way you're talking about, I mean, you, you demonstrated so much tonight that there's inherently a distrust of any institution, any support, any structure. So if, I think architects, we tend to overestimate our value, especially when it comes to, we're gonna make a, create, a space for you to perform and uh, express yourself. It's, it, but that would essentially, they would distrust that. So in a way it's this sort of, you need a regime to fight, you know, something to reject. So in a way, if it was more top-down and more oppressive, it would create more of a, uh, a revolution, say, or more things to reject. So I personally think that by trying to sort of essentially institutionalize things that thrive outside of an institution will, will undermine them. And because I, I think this is inherent distrust. I think you demonstrated this tonight. Yes. Yeah. No, I agree with that. Brian. I mean, I think that's the fun of it. Okay, Brian. Brian, I, Brian I've, been way, I've been thinking of you this whole time because of experience culture. Well, it's, I'm thinking also about the, a merger that um, is, is kind of already been happening for a decade or so, which is undercover marketing and, and uh, a, a kind of immersive branding and, yeah. and the way in which, I don't know, Randy, how much your project that you described, this kind of multi-layer underground project is really driven by the retailer who's sponsoring it. But the, the amount of interaction we have through individuals who are given products to wear or cultivate or discuss or positioned in space. So the, the kind of scripting of consumption in this way through the city is that kind of scripted environment, right? And I think what's, what's exciting to think about on one hand is the kind of fluid blending of, you know, setting up of these kind of moments of interaction and then having the aleatory aspects of real life kind of surround them. Um, but then there's a the question of how I think how much that, that control or that dominance is tied into questions of capital through scripting. Yes. Um, not, I'm not trying to sort of argue against capital here, but, but rather the point, I know Mitesh, we we'll go back and forth. <laughs> um, but, but rather the role of that very precise kind of scripting in everyday environments when we think about the, the theater in the city, right? For me, it is a question of, uh, of the kind of emotional labor that is involved when one, or the difference between the emotional labor of someone who's doing that in society, hired to do that in society, versus someone who's hired to do that as a theatrical performer, right? So there's a kind of a safe space, I would say, mm -hmm. in the world that you're directing and conducting, um, where these people are actors, they're they're Well, it's like what I said, you're guild, buying a probably, ticket. Right? Exactly. Well, also, you know, it's very clear Precisely. that this is demarcated as this event that takes three hours, and I bought a ticket, and it's going to have a beginning and an end. Yep, yeah, I know that. The actors know that. Everyone knows right? that. I mean, We've so, all bought that. Exactly, which is a very different kind of emotional labor Definitely. when you're From putting city? someone to be a 24-7 brand ambassador. And you're wearing a mask. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but we all wear masks. That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Can I say one thing about that? I, I, it's funny because there's two things, actually. One is, I think, when you're talking about the city or any project, I look at it as poetry. Is there enough stuff here that it's stimulating people to have a poetic response in the sense that it's open to interpretation? Which is the essence of, again, the uns less narrative, sleep no more, versus the superscripted, frankly, Hamilton, even. You know what I mean? Like, that is defined. He wants you to feel this, this moment. There's a shitload of information coming to you because it's rap, so that's very exciting. But essentially, we're all going to feel the same thing. When George Washington comes out, we all cheer. And when Hamilton does this, we all know where it's asleep no more. You might have had a completely different experience. So my final comment, I really wanted to say this because you talked about this. I always say this. People say, Randy, how was the show last night? And I always say, I have no idea. <laughs> it's like I am the mayor of New York. And being the mayor of New York, a baby was born over here. 
A man was murdered over there. This artist <laughs> created something over here. All these different things happen. And I can't judge it or you know, put it together in any sort of way to say, yeah, tonight the crowd laughed like crazy at this and they all stood up. So that's one of the things, again, I love about it. So it's funny when we're talking about a city because I always analogize myself to being the mayor. And when people say, how was it? I'm like, I don't know. You know. How does the mayor feel every night? How do you judge a night? I think that's a great place to end. So help, uh, welcome, join me in thanking the guests. Thanks.